I'm going to talk to you about a lot of things today. Uh, microRNAs, early cancer detection, but also natural language processing, machine learning, digital microfluidics, and hardware. Um, so <laughs> <laughs> if somebody has any question, please interrupt me. I want to be as transparent, as open with my company as I can. So I'm very comfortable answering any question. Uh, I'm going to start with a story. Uh, so when I was going back home uh, while in college for a summer break, I remember getting into my into my cars, uh, into my dad's cars, into my dad's car, and uh, when I when I look at the dashboard of his car, the dashboard looked exactly like this. Everything that could be on was on in the dashboard, uh, and we talked about it, and he said, <laughs> and he said, I, I I want to find someone that helps me plug it off because I don't want to see the alerts anymore. Uh, and that, that is a way to react to that kind of things. But another, I think, more uh, responsible way to react is whenever you see an alert uh, shining, you will take it to ma for maintenance in order so they can fix something before it's too late <laughs> and, and, and before it's too expensive. I believe the human body also has a dashboard and also has a way that to tell us uh, that something stops work, st has stopped working uh, as, as it should be working, in, as normal as normal, even before symptoms, even in the very early stages. Uh, and I believe those sensors for that dashboard are microRNAs. So most of you might know what microRNA is, but I will still explain it. Uh, so basically, we have the DNA, the information of, of what we are. And in order to, be, to make that information actionable, uh, we have the messenger RNA that takes uh, pa uh, code parts of the DNA out of the nucleus of the cell and combines with other enzymes to try to create proteins. And potentially, it can create, it's a, it's a big molecule, uh, potentially it can create hundreds of, of proteins. But the ones that tell them how many they can build and when can they uh, build them are microRNAs. So microRNAs, what they do, it's they regulate gene expression, mainly as silencers. Uh, and they do that post-transcriptionally, as, as just, like, I've just explained. Uh, microRNAs were, the first microRNA was discovered in 1994 by uh, Professor Ambrose from UMass. And, uh, but they thought it was a gene at the moment. It took uh, around 10, 10, 10 more years to discover the second microRNA and to discover that there were no, no genes. And it was until 2008 where our advisor, Professor Munish Tewari, discovered that microRNAs can circulate freely in, in blood whenever the cells are being broken apart. Uh, there's a lot of publications out there about, yeah. There's a lot of publications out there about uh, the presence of microRNA circulated in blood uh, while uh, expressing a specific disease, as you can see here. So each different, each specific type of disease has a unique pattern of microRNAs that can be shown even at the very early stages of that disease. Uh, mainly, there's mo mo more of the, the research has been done on cancer, but there's very recent uh, research also in neurodegenerative diseases as well, and as, as I will show, uh, also in infectious diseases. Uh, so one thing that is very cool about microRNAs is that they are very uh, specific to an organ or uh, an organ system. There are around 700 different microRNAs in your body, um, but there, for example, microRNA1, it's a heart microRNA. And we can see that uh, from Drosophila to mouse to ourselves, that all the, all the way through evolution, that same microRNA regulates the cells of the heart. Or microRNA124 does the same for the nervous system. Um, this, one, this was one of the first and uh, a major paper about microRNAs. And basically what they did is they took uh, tissue, sample, tissue biopsies of uh, different types of cancer and they profiled them for microRNAs and they, they, they asked a machine to, to, uh, to cluster them based only on the, on the specificity of those microRNAs. And the machine did a very good job into uh, clustering very close types of cancer uh, without, without the help of any human. So this started to create an explosion of microRNAs and the potential. And then they started comparing also with uh, how, how can they uh, differentiate the, during the stages of different diseases? As you can see here, where there is a paper that shows the ratio between the mi two microRNAs, 92A and 
38, and uh, during a disease. And you can see that that ratio, when the person is normal or in complete remission, it's present. But when the person has the, the, has a condition or a relapse, then it's it has a clear difference between the, within that ratio. Um, or this one, where we compare in metastatic breast cancer a protein biomarker with a microRNA biomarker. Uh, as you can see here on the on the left side, that's the protein biomarker, pre-operation, post-operation, and chemotherapy. And as you can see on the y-axis, it's uh, it's linear. So and so it's basically not different. It's very difficult to see. But in microRNAs, the y-axis is <laughs> logarithmical, and you can see that there's a big difference between pre-operation and post-operation. So it can also tell us <coughs> how the disease is progressing or not. Um, and this is particularly important when detecting also uh, particularly cancer in very early stages, when the survival rate and the treatment, whatever treatment is uh, decided by the doctor, has better chances of uh, taking effect. Uh, today we're detecting cancer in stage three and four, most of them. The cancer that are killing us the most are lung cancer and stomach cancer. But if we can detect them in very, in very early stages, then the survival rate will be much higher. This actual charge is for uh, stomach cancer. <clears throat> so microRNAs, they have been proven to have a diagnostic, prognostic, predictive, and, and even therapeutic uh, uh, potential. Uh, as diagnostic, they have been found to be circulated in biofluids, so that's saliva, serum, plasma, uh, urine, and that's where we're targeting diagnostic at this moment. Uh, there's a lot of research in prognostic, there's a lot of re research and even commercial uh, applications, both in prognostic and therapeutic. So first, so first, when we started doing this, uh, I will, I will have a parenthesis about machine learning, about natural language processing now. Uh, I will come back to science. But first, if you, if you go to PubMed and to all the publications and look at what has been published about microRNAs, that's, that's the first place we wanted to go to understand what is out there already. And to understand also which microRNA research and which microRNA panels have analytical validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility, if possible. So, but if, but if you discover that there's around a million different publications around microRNAs. It's a field that is exploding. So what we decided to do, and that, that has been proven to be very useful and you will know later, when you want to, when you want to, to start uh, uh, looking for papers, first you do search, you choose, you retrieve, you read, and you learn. But you can do this, as, I, as a scientist, you can only do this, I don't know, 10 times, 20 times, 100 times will require a lot of time. So what we did this is we created a cluster and we scraped the entire literature from since the beginning of, of everything that has PubMed, and we use a, a technology called Hadoop, which is an elephant, and basically it's a lot of machines that are reading PubMed and PMC. So the elephant right now, uh, and we're trying to identify entities. The entities are what's the relationship between microRNAs, genes, and conditions or diseases. So the the, the elephant has has uh, understood or has in the, in the database around 200 million different sentences that find those relationship. Um, and as you can see, um, well, this is, we, we decided to go, to go through the entire literature so you can see something that is interesting, how there's publications about genes and mutations around the 1970s, 60s, uh, and now there's uh, just as, as much as chemical and diseases. But microRNA is a field that started exploding right in 2008 when they were discovered to be uh, circulated in blood. Um, so what we created is this tool, and it's a tool that we're using with all our collaborators, uh, our collaborators right now as scientists. Um, and basically, whatever whatever panel you want to decide about microRNA, you can you can type whatever disease you want, even if you don't know uh, the panel. You you see which microRNAs are present and which microRNA how they regulate those specific genes. It has a brief summary, uh, the most relevant papers that have more clinical validity as well. And finally, you can read which microRNAs are and the specific sentence of that relationship between microRNAs. So that saves a lot of time uh, for scientists, and that is helping us a lot designing our microRNA panels. Whenever we find something that it's that it's something that uh, it's interested, it's interesting. We go there to the literature and we find that somebody already reported this, so it makes sense our results or not. Uh, and this f uh, fits our machine learning mo machine learn models that I will show later. Uh, Detecting microRNAs today, it's been done with a machine like that. Most, that's the gold standard, it's a qPCR. 
It's a $35,000 instrument that we have in, a lab, in, the, in our lab two blocks from here. And uh, so in order to, so we bought this machine, $35,000. Uh, they sent two people to train our our three uh, three scientists from our team. It includes that computer that is next to it. They don't let that com they don't let us that computer to connect to the internet, not put anything there because it will get a virus, and uh, and uh, it's still very complicated. So what we're trying to do is not to discover how micro how to detect micronis. We want to make this better. We want to make this easier, and we want to make this uh, for the field. We want to democratize the access of micronis detection. So. Our first prototype is what you, the machine that you can see there. Uh, our first, second prototype is this one. You will see. Uh, so basically what we're developing is an entire platform of microRNA detection. We, are det we, we have developed a molecular bioassay, and we have a couple of patents on that. We are developing an instrument, which is not that one. I will, I will talk about that, uh, which is based on digital microfluidics, and we have a few patents on of that and data algorithms uh, for the analysis and interpretation, and also to understand if there's actual signal or pure noise. Um, so the first part, the assay, it's uh, basically we, what we're doing, it's, it's the protocol is called LAMP. Uh, it's, it's a protocol that works in the field, and it has, it, as you can see, it's fluorescence, and you can see it with your naked eye whenever there's a presence of microne. So in each, in each of these wells, uh, there's a trap that we uh, design and each well is, is looking for a specific each trap is looking for a specific microRNA so it's it's a targeted approach we're not we're not out discovering we need to know which what are we looking for in terms of microRNAs and then depending on which microRNAs shine then that means it's a it's a particular pattern all the diseases that we're looking for have a pattern of around 7 to 15 microRNAs so in an 96 well plate we can fit several diseases um, so we developed this this uh, first uh, instrument, basically what it, what it had, it's, it's, uh, it was like a helmet, and you put your smartphone on top of it. The smartphone was taking pictures, figuring out which wells are shining, how much and how fast, and sending that information to our cloud. So you can see it here. This was the first 3D, well, the 3D printed and the wooden version. Uh, so you close it, you put your smartphone, and basically it's, uh, so. There you can see one. Uh, that shine is different. Uh, the problem with doing prototypes with uh, wood is that you cannot control heat. And this is heating, so it has an isothermal reaction. So we decided to move forward from that. Um, the, second, the second version, so the evolution, is that one. Is it, this one is a new one that I, that I brought. And basically what it does, it, uh, it's, it's an Arduino. It has an Arduino Mega, and we created a shield that you want, the one that you can see over there. And that shield, what it's doing is basically controlling these four plates. So the shield is here with Arduino, and the four plates are here. So it has a top plate, which is that one, which is avoiding condensation. It has a plate where you put uh, the sample uh, where that is doing the isothermal conditions. You can heat it to whatever temperature you want. And then we have an arrange of photodiodes, uh, of LEDs, sorry, that are shining next to the well. Uh, to create the fluorescence, and then on the bottom, an arrange of photodiodes that it's absorbing the light. And we do that every minute. It sells that information to our cloud, and it's very, very simple. Uh, this, I brought it. This is a new version. It's, it's, it's controlled via Wi-Fi, so I brought it thinking if you want to play with it. And if somebody knows and has a reagents to do a lamp or an ELISA, you can do it. Uh, but the problem was that we, we want our platform to be to be easy to use, uh, to be affordable, uh, to be to connect to our cloud to centralize the data, and obviously to be accurate. The problem with this version uh, is that it's not easy to use. You still require how to, to know how to pipe it and to combine two microliters of this with two microliters of that with specific quantities. So that was not something that will work in Guatemala, for example. So we decided to move forward with a technology called digital microfluidics, which is a cartridge like this. And basically, what we're doing in digital microfluidics, it's, uh, it's, a, it's an array of electrodes uh, that we can control. This, this one in particular has 120 electrodes that we apply a voltage, something between 180 volts to up to 300 volts, depending on the, on the, on the liquid and the, and the reagent that we want to move. And basically, uh, it, we, put a, we put a glass on top of it, and the space 
that it created between the electrode and the glass, it creates like a capacitance. And whenever you change the polarity of the electrode, it will create a force that will push a li uh, liquid, as you can see here. Um, so here we're controlling a, a, a droplet of water, 200 voltios. Every 150 milliseconds, we're changing the polarity. So the control is perfect. We can move it back, far, forth. Um, so it's a very cool technology. Uh, so, so this first prototype, uh, basically, it has four uh, chambers. The first one is where you put the sample. Uh, and here you for the four reagents that requires our cocktail, our reaction to happen. And then we have two heating zones, uh, one here, and then here, this one can only detect three microRNAs, but it works. This is a very fancy way of playing Pac-Man. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we, we are thinking of how to design in a way that, because it's very cool, so it, we, we're thinking how to design in a way that people can see their sample moving. Yeah. Uh, but we haven't thought yet. Uh, the, the very cool thing about that is that uh, basically what we're doing, it's, it's, it doesn't matter. This is PCV, but it's, it, it also works in glass, which is very difficult to manufacture. Uh, but, it, but we have a, pi a patent that uh, when you put a, a specific combination uh, to, a, to ink, you, you make it a, a conductive, conductive, ink, a conductive ink, and you can print it on paper. Uh, so the potential is it looks terrible there, but the potential is that you can print, uh, you can print on paper your own circuits and just put it in the instrument, and you can run the reaction. It's not that easy because it requires it requires uh, it requires a lot of heat, and with paper, as you know, uh, well. And the l the last part is the is the data part. For us, it's very important that we we not we don't call ourselves as a cheap test to detect microRNAs and a specific disease of that, uh, that those microRNAs are related to. We want to be a data company. So all the information, all these instruments are connected to our cloud. And this, these instruments are actually very dumb. They only know how to hit and, uh, and they, they know how to move things. But they don't know what's happening there. So that information is being served to our cloud where we, can con where we are receiving the information and we are at the very beginning, we're doing machine learning to try to understand if there's signal or noise while we have a, a perfect signal. And then we'll be just doing uh, pure statistics. So you find you found these microRNAs, therefore you have this particular disease. So all the information is being collected, theref and therefore we can better understand uh, how microRNAs change. If we, ha if we find new patterns of microRNAs, uh, if, we, if we found that the microRNA pattern is different in different populations as well. So we have a... We have a we have a, a tool where all our collaborators and all our clinical trials that are well, preclinical trials that are happening right now, uh, it's, it's where they are seeing the results in real time as well. Um, so this is the baseline of a human life. If you are healthy, birth predisposition, you are presymptomatic, and you have clinical symptoms. And there are, very, uh, there are different companies in those spaces uh, trying to figure out uh, uh, our life in those. I, I believe the best the best approach is right now we're all targeting clinical people that have clinical symptoms. It's it's uh, it's uh, it's easier. The market is very big, but I believe the future of medicine is the healthy and predisposition. I believe that if we can, in a very very easy way, you can monitor your your own biomarkers. You can you can compare against yourself how those biomarkers are changing over time. Then you can know. Uh, when those things that are used to be normal are stopping to be normal. And therefore, adjust whatever needs to be adjusted with minor medicine, with minor medication, with minor changes of your life before you, before you become presymptomatic. So this, although we're targeting people who have clinical symptoms, we want to move it eventually that way. And eventually, we are not saying that we want to detect gastric cancer in your house, but we want this eventually, that is something that you can do in a very, very easy way that you can monitor different biomarkers and their level of biomarkers and compare against it yourself. Um, we are doing right now four different conditions, three, three different conditions, sorry. The first one is gastric cancer, is the one that we have better results. Uh, we are only already doing a collaboration. We already started some small clinical trial in Chile with the, the Universidad Católica de Chile, and we are already expanding it with the NIH, in collaboration with the NIH. 
And basically, the point here, this is not this is obvious, this is not early detection, as you will see. So basically, what we're doing is uh, targeting just uh, symptomatic individuals. So people that go to an endoscopy for any reason. 95% uh, of endoscopies, well, 65% of endoscopies were it was nothing. Around 33% um, it was uh, atrophic gastritis, and around just a few two, three percent, it was a gastric cancer, depending on the, on the place. The average cost of an endoscopy is $300. Here in the US, it's much more. Uh, and what, we, what we're thinking is, what would happen if we can put a microRNA panel before the endoscopy? We can save not only millions of dollars to the health systems, but we can also save the biopsy pain, the, uh, 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 the, the, all, the, all the problems for the patients. Um, so right now what we're doing is we're doing a clinical trial where at the moment on this endoscopy we collect saliva and plasma um, to try to understand a panel. And uh, these are very, very preliminary data. We just received the samples and finished processing those samples uh, uh, three weeks ago. And basically what we're comparing here is gastric cancer with, with chronic gastrit atrophic gastritis. And when I say that I, we're doing machine uh, learning model, since we don't know which the panel is, we need to discover it at this moment. Uh, first of all, we need to know if we're signal or noise. So if we do pure statistics, it will be biased because we want, in the statistics, you can find whatever you want to find. So basically, this is machine learning. And it's a model called a, a, a gradient boosted decision forest. Uh, well, two models, gradient boosted and decision forest. And basically, what we're doing is, uh, first of all, training a model, telling, telling that person with fitting in with we provide for around 180 different microRNAs, uh, and we, we put for each sample 180 microRNAs, the sex and the gender of that individual, and the clinical truth, gastric cancer or chronic atrophic gastritis. So around 20 people, 20 of the 30 samples, around 20, we did it to train the model, and 10, we did it to, uh, to predict the model. Then in a blind test, we will tell the model, this is, this is the information, you tell us if there's signal or noise. And as you can see, the results are very comparable. So that's very promising, with an with an ASU of around 0.8. Uh, this is this is very very preliminary, although it's optimistic. But right now we are already in conversations. Uh, we already presented this the data to the NIH and other institutions in Latin America, and we are about to do uh, one of the largest uh, gastric cancer microRNA projects uh, that uh, in the world. Uh, and we hope that we can present the, the, the results by March, which is the, most, the, month, uh, the month to fight gastric cancer. Uh, another condition that we're doing here with UCSF is Chagas disease. Uh, this is a complete different area. This is a, uh, an infectious disease. And basically, it's, it's a parasite that is very, uh, uh, pre it's prevalent, it's very prevalent in Latin America, as you can see. And basically, uh, it's uh, the main problem about this is that uh, most people can live with Chagas, but 30% of the people that has Chagas, they will develop a cardiomyopathy and uh, eventually uh, will have a very high risk of having a heart attack. And right now, there's no way to detect uh, which are those 30% that we should uh, prioritize in terms of treatment. So this was a complete, uh, there was no literature, prior literature, it was, a, it was a complete uh, project of discovery uh, where some scientists from Job Hopkins and UCSF told us if there's a way that with microRNA, since they are so specific to heart or to any other organ, can we find, can we find those uh, people uh, that have early stages of cardiomyopathy? And we could. So we received 30 plasma samples again, 20 from healthy individuals and 10 with Chagas specific. Uh, 20 with normal EKG, sorry, 10 with normal EKG, 10 with not, not abnormal EKG in terms of Chagas, and uh, 10 with Chagas-specific abnormal EKG. So very early stages uh, of, um, uh, of cardiomyopathy. We did the same machine learning model, A, A minus, A plus, and B plus. And as you can see, the prediction test is even better. Here, uh, <coughs> it's a panel of around seven microRNAs that are very specific to hypoxia, very specific to the heart. So the micronase makes also makes a lot of sense. Um, so we are going to present the results tomorrow. Actually, this is a, a, a preliminary for you. 
And so I don't know what's going to happen. I'll tell you later. Uh, but I hope that they help get, give us some more samples. Because right now, we cannot, obviously, we cannot say that this is the final panel. We need further tests. So right now, but this is enough to know that there's something there and to try to figure out if we can get more samples and try to figure out if we can actually find the panel and, and obviously deploy this in the field in Latin America. Another condition that we're doing, it's uh, onchocerciasis, uh, also by, better known as river blindness. This is a project uh, that affects mainly, uh, this is a disease that affects mainly African population, around 40 million people. And it's basically a worm uh, that you goes into your body when you uh, drink contaminated water. And it's, it can be reproducing in, in your body for around 30 years. And eventually, you, you'll, you'll become blind because of it. Um, uh, actually, the Nobel Prize of Medicine a few, a few weeks ago was awarded to the person that discovered the treatment. Tr treatment is very easy, and it's free. Uh, uh, Merck, the company that this person was working on, decided to make this um, drug for free forever. Uh, so, but the problem is how to detect it. So today, there are kidney biopsies of five different points of your, uh, places in your body. Uh, they leave those, those biopsies for 24 hours. Uh, and they and they try to and then they come back and figure out if there was a worm. So it's very difficult. So uh, there's a project. This is a, this is not our panel. This is a panel that was discovered of the and the University of Edinburgh. And they uh, there was a competition of the Gates Foundation to figure out which was the best biomarkers to detect uh, onchocerciasis from plasma. And the University of Edinburgh they won with micronase. Uh, they can detect four micronase of the worm. So not not on the, not of the human. So that's that's also very interesting because the quantities are, are extremely small. And technically speaking, it's very it's very uh, interesting project for our platform because we can test it in a very very complicated uh, situations. And as you can see here, we can go down to 50 atom uh, in the in the last replica that you can see there. Um, so that's that's very good because 50 atom is as comparable as a qPCR. So we with this thing that costs 80 dollars. We can do the same as a like, 35,000 instrument. Uh, so <clears throat> we still don't know what, what's going to happen with this project. But technically speaking, this is the first. Uh, this might be our first application in terms of we already know which ma four micronase are. We already know. Uh, although obviously you cannot deploy this in, in Africa because you still require how to pipe it. But uh, we'll figure something out. And the last one is lung cancer, non-small cell lung cancer. This is also our panel. This is a panel that was discovered in Italy. And <clears throat> it's one of the best studies ever done in micronase. They follow a population of 1,000 high-risk individuals for lung cancer for five years. And they were comparing their uh, micronase results with low dosity. Uh, and they discovered that not only they have the same specificity and sensitivity levels of low dosity, but the, but the false rate positive it's five times less. So a low CT has a false rate of 20%. This micronase of 16 panels, uh, this, this panel of 16 micronase from serum has a false positive rate of 3% and 3.7%. Uh, and <clears throat> from, and they, they, already com they already licensed the panel to a company in San Diego called Gensignia. They, will go they are going to start uh, uh, commercializing this panel next year as a centralized, as a centralized lab. And we just signed a collaboration with them uh, to test those same, these 16 micronase in serum. We have never done any tests with serum. All our tests are with plasma uh, in, our, in our platform. So figure out if we can also detect them with the same levels as, as, uh, as a qPCR. And, and uh, we are also actively targeting, trying to get samples uh, to validate this and panel if the population that we're targeting. <clears throat> so uh, I believe that. A micronase, although there, there's, there's not any company out there for diagnosis or for screening uh, doing micronase, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's coming very soon. Uh, Japan and Denmark are, the two, are two countries. Japan, in this case, they are already putting uh, around 7 billion gens into doing a, a, a one single a panel of, of micronase to detect 13 different types of cancer as a public policy. And every time you do a urinal checkup, you will get this, this panel, and they hope they can get it out in the market in 2018. It's a consortium of different companies. <clears throat> and uh, in terms of the market, we're not targeting the US. We're not targeting Japan, and we're not targeting Europe. We're targeting 
where 70% of the cancer incidents are, which is Latin America and Southeast Asia. So <clears throat> we, are, we believe we are the only company that can take this uh, to the field. We believe we are the only company that, uh, uh, that can target this long tail. So that's what we're targeting. And that's why our tests are being done all in Latin America. And that's why almost 60% of our investors are from China. <clears throat> so in the end, and now I will leave it for questions and if you want to play. So in the end, what we want to do, uh, it's uh, there's, there's a lot of very interesting science coming out. Uh, and, and we don't want most of those, most of those treatments, uh, immunotherapy, and that's it's very encouraging, and it's and it's amazing. And I believe 2015 or 20, 2013, when the, this started, is the year that we started seeing that we really can beat cancer. Uh, but I still believe that is something that is accessible only for the very privileged. So I believe that uh, with these kind of technologies, we can target, we can really democratize this, and we, we we can really save millions of lives. And what we want to do, we, we are not targeting uh, therapy, we're not targeting treatment. We want to detect cancer in early stages so we can radically change how it's detected and how it's treated, and therefore to save much more lives. Thank you very much. because the cancers are more specific to those people culturally, or is it because um, that's where your focus is? Because how is that technology not applicable in other regions? Yeah, I mean, it's not that we don't want to do, do it in the US. Um, gastric cancer in the US is not a big problem. Uh, Europe, neither. In Latin America, is the number one killer in terms of cancer. Uh, the country that has more cancer it's, uh, in the world is Guatemala then Costa Rica, then Peru, then Chile, and obviously in uh, Japan, South Korea, uh, and China. So all these countries uh, is what we want to target with this first application. We believe gastric cancer can be our first application. We're very happy with the results. Um, so we're targeting for those. Um, it wouldn't make sense, neither commercial, to do it in the US, because here it's, I don't know, it's like 17. So it's, it's, not, it's, really, it's not really a problem. Uh, but it, it's not that we're, not, we're completely discarded in the US, no, definitely not. Uh, we believe even the data that we're collecting can be very valuable to U.S. companies that are developing drugs uh, and treatment. Just, I had a question. In terms of the micro DNA, is there any? Is there? Are there ambiguities? Do you have to have a number of them to identify a particular cancer? It, is it a group, essentially? It's a group. It's a panel, mm -hmm. but I cannot tell you if it's as, as you see. Lung cancer is sixteen. Uh, Chagas is seven, gastric cancer we're seeing that, that it's ten, so it's 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 around those numbers. And you're just determining those amplifiers empirically correlating the you know, micro RNA with the cancer. I don't know exactly why it's related to that cancer. We know that they they regulate the genes, so whenever there's a deregulation, they are there. You can we we did an experiment for four months. All the people, all the, all, everybody in our company, we're getting our blood drawn every week. Uh, and we were able, uh, we wanted to compare, to figure out how microns change in a normal, healthy individual. So we, we figure out if they change between men and women, uh, with exercise, with alcohol, uh, with infection, with diarrhea, and they are basically very stable. Uh, we didn't see any difference between men, women doing exercise, alcohol, they are very stable. So whenever you find them they're, they're regulated, that means that there's a presence of a specific disease. It's just a matter of figuring out which disease. So within a, a given <laughs> cancer type, could microRNAs be used to determine whether there's some genetic um, mutation? Does it say if you have a, a you know, a met positive tumor versus a met negative tumor or something like that? <clears throat> so microRNAs, in what, so they come from genes and they regulate genes. So what we can know, for example, that's an experiment that we tried with my 23andMe data. It's 
I, if I know that I don't have a specific mutation of a particular SNP, then therefore I cannot produce a specific microRNA that regulates that with gene. So, uh, but but in that, that's that's all that I know that we can do. Is there, is there any difference between the early part of the disease expressions versus the late part of the disease? It should be in terms of the expression level of the microRNAs. That's what we're seeing. So it's not only that you have it or not. It's, it's that you have it a lot or very uh, down-regulated or over-regulated. So right now, we are a semi-quantitative platform. We cannot tell you the specific numbers as a QPCR, but we can tell you that you have a lot of microRNA 21, or very little of it. Uh, so during the progression of the disease, you should see that the levels are going up or down. So the, the, the number, the minimum number that you guys came up with, six or five, is basically which of them eventually leads to the late-stage disease? So right now, we haven't done any tests where we do follow the progression of, of people. Uh, but the Italians did with, the, with this panel of 16. And they, they basically just, what they say is just basically this, those 16 micronates, but just the levels is what varies during the progression of the disease. So I was going to ask if, if it was semi-quantitative or quantitative. It sounds like it's semi-quantitative. Yep. If you were to make it quantitative, so you have um, better resolution in the levels, would that give you? better accuracy? We don't think so. Uh, we think uh, we think that we just, we, for us, it's just a matter of you have it a lot or very little. And that's therefore they have the presence of a specific microRNA. And you have it very, very downregulated or very overregulated. So, but no, we don't, we don't think it will affect that we don't know the specific CQ values. Uh, are you aware of any work, either by yourself or others, to We are not doing it, but most of the, I will say 90% of the commercial applications of microRNAs are focusing on that. Uh, so there's companies in Philadelphia, in New York, here, in San Diego, in Boston, that are targeting specifically that. Yes. Uh, does the ratio of each, they have a particular cancer that they has seven microRNAs that show up, does the ratio of those seven change as the disease progresses. Not, not the absolute value, but the ratio. You know, we can normalize, say, on one of them. Does the rate, you know, do the others uh, track it, or does their ratios change as the disease progresses? That, I don't know. Uh, that, I don't know. We, I don't have that answer. So, that there's <laughs> so I, I had a question. Uh, in terms of detecting these microRNAs, there must be some background, right, where a normal, healthy person has some of those floating around. And how much is that, and how much more do you have to see before you decide this person has a serious illness? Yeah. So we've seen, for example, if you take an aspirin, uh, we'll see that there's some microRNAs. If you have a, a lot of beers tonight, you will have some microRNAs tomorrow related to the liver. So, so yes, uh, it, it also it's a matter also of understanding the quality of life of the person and the context. Uh, yeah, um, I, I don't know yet that answer. Until we go to market, we need to figure that out. But I'm, I'm wondering uh, how different aspects of diabetes and metabolic disorders um, show up in microRNA data. Yeah, so we can go here. So this is the tool that I was telling you about. So <laughs> diabetes complications, diabetes mellitus type 2. <laughs> and you can see that there are, so already has a, already studied that, so a lot of it. Is it prognostic for the risk of developing complications? Is that this economically and public health wise extraordinarily valuable? Uh, the papers that I've seen, I, we have not we have not targeted metabolic disease at all. But the papers that I've seen is just for the complications related to macronis, retinoblastomy, those kind of things are the ones that are that they've been found. Are they are the ones that are most studied? I'll just make a like an endorsement of, of, of something 
about your business strategies, this is sort of a skeptical question earlier, which is um, uh, there aren't really incentives in, in the United States in particular to make the same test a lot cheaper or the same procedure a lot cheaper. Um, people, politicians talk as if there is such an incentive, but there isn't. And, and on the other hand, uh, the numbers of people who will face diseases like diabetes and cancer elsewhere in the world, they cannot afford American and European style of treatments. Anyway. Um, so you, you're in the position of doing the classic Christensen innovators dilemma of, of places in the world that are ignored because the dollars are what count in markets and not the suffering, and develop pretty good approaches that will get better. And companies with approaches like yours towards frugal and, and effective technology will, will win. Uh, I mean, the United States may be the last to adopt, but it, it's much more logical um, from a strategic standpoint if you can get access to the, to the emerging um, market um, health systems, you know, through the ministers and whatever mechanism. Yeah, so that thing, I, I will steal your answer for next time that somebody else answers <laughs> ask me that, but, but uh, also targeting emerging economies, they know that, they need that. So whenever we go to Mexico, to Chile, uh, to, Ma to Thailand, Getting samples is easy. Uh, here, here in the U.S., it, it should cut, it, it, it will, will still be uh, in, the pro in the paper process. And in those countries, it was a couple of meetings, uh, and there are the samples. So. I, have a, I have a quick question about your business strategy. You, um, you're, you're not doing discovery, right? You're not looking for the patterns. You're building an instrument platform for doing inexpensive and efficient microRNA. Testing, right? So, so your your machine is a is basically a fluorescence plate reader with a you know PCR, a thermocycler. Uh, it's you know, it's not thermocycler, but yeah. But uh, ha, ha, but you still have to take after you take the blood, you still have to process the blood, and how do you do that? Do you have a system yep. to do that, or, or is that just standard? So, we we the input is plasma. Uh, we do total RNA extraction here and then microRNA, uh, but the input is plasma yet. We, we are looking actively to places to solve how to get plasma. Uh, or, uh, the, the problem with the red blood cells, when they, when they break apart and hemolyze blood, it's our biggest enemy because they release microRNAs. Yeah, the platelets have lots of exosomes yeah. and have lots of microRNAs. So we don't want those microRNAs. That can be lead us to inaccurate results. So we need, uh, that's, that's, that's the main challenge in, that, in our technology, that we need someone to discover how to go from blood to total RNA. Uh, devil's advocate question. <coughs> what makes microRNAs the magical biomarker that's better, more efficient, et cetera, than other uh, biomarkers or other RNAs, for that, example, for that matter? And <laughs> slightly related question, what's the maximum length of an RNA that you can um, assay into your device? So I don't think they're magical. I think they, it, it will be a combination. So I, we're targeting microRNAs right now, but in the future we can add proteins here, another, another um, or perhaps even some genes. So I, I think it will be a combination of different biomarkers, not only my own microRNAs. Uh, with our assay and our conditions, microRNAs are, are between 19 to 21 nucleotides. We can go as long as 90 Nine nucleotides. Yeah. With the same assay and conditions, if we make some modifications perhaps. It's how the how the trap works. <coughs> for, for any, any kind of cancer, you will feel it in the blood. Which? Isn't it so surprising that this is in the blood for any kind of cancer? Isn't it surprising? Yeah. What is this, uh, well, there are different markers for different types of cancer. Uh, at the end, it's just the, re uh, the regulation of genes. So yes, there has been a studies that shows that microRNAs, but the problem is how do you normalize that information? How do you figure out that, that it's the real panel and not noise? So that's something that is still in development. The more, mic the more microRNAs get validated, the, the better for us. Yeah. I have a quick question on the data that you showed with gastric cancer and going from pre-op to post-op and the different staging. Um, you know, showed a nice trend, but there was a lot of overlap across the population. 
So I was curious about kind of the reproducibility. Was that run on your platform? And two, you know, when you're trying to actually make that prediction, how are you going to set those thresholds and normalize to your point? Yeah. Yeah, that's something that, that we need to, to do as we, go we move forward and make our, uh, our model more robust, our panel. Um, it's better to, to have a false positive than a false negative. Uh, so we need to find a threshold that, and send home. At, when we are sending home someone, we really know that that person can be sent home. I, I don't have an answer for that, but that's something that we need to do. Yeah. This, is, uh, this is slightly off from your main topic, but about uh, 10, 15 years ago, there was a lot of excitement about gene silencing with RNA. And I could wonder if you could just briefly comment on where that went. Uh, I know I invested in that, and now I sort of happily forgotten about it, but remind me. <laughs> so I'm not a molecular biologist, so I'm not, I'm not the one that I can comment about something that happened 10 years ago in <laughs> molecular biology. But I, I can share with you a paper uh, that was released by Mayo Clinic, I think, two months ago, that they were able, with artificially uh, putting microRNAs, they were able to shut down some uh, cancerous genes uh, successfully. So it's a, it was a very interesting uh, paper that I can. Um, on the note of false positives, um, what's your estimation for your gastric cancer application on your false positive rate given the population prevalence of gastric cancer in Latin America? Because there is a price to be paid for the false positives. People have to undergo very invasive procedures a significant cost, and in those economies, yeah. um, it's a significant cost to people to chase up the false positives as well. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree, and and I I think it's related to the previous question. I, I still we still haven't defined our thresholds, so I I don't know. We we will need to find a. We're we're receiving several hundred of samples from different countries, so that's also that that will be very, very powerful because we're not only testing in the same hospital, but different populations, how microRNAs vary. So we believe we can have a very solid panel of microRNAs. But that's something that I, I will be able to answer in, in a few months. So um, there are three different questions that touched upon this. I want to drill down a little bit deeper. The <coughs> biological specificity of your panel and in the beginning, you show a slide where different microRNA clearly show up in different tissues. So you had the embryo expression data. And so is there at all a possibility, like for breast cancer, the virgin new fish test was a pathophysiology-based signature? And that, in the long run, can take care of the issue of false positive, false negative, because it's part of the molecular pathogenesis. And nowhere in your talk have you ever allowed yourself to say that your panel will be tied to <coughs> molecular pathophysiology. Hmm. So in the end, it remains a correlational discovery and you just have to dump a lot of samples and overwhelm the type of patients who will show up in the clinic that should be diagnosed as negative, where the heterogeneity is much larger. Am I getting the picture correct? Mm -hmm. okay. So of, of the, the, that graph that I showed is just tissue microRNAs, uh, which is, there are 700. But the ones that circulate, not the 700 circulate in blood, around 200 circulate in blood. Right, but so, so with respect to cancer, you're in the position of <laughs> detecting a microRNA that are somehow aberrantly expressed. They're not necessarily part of, I mean, and you're not doing the discovery of the, that they're part of the molecular pathophysiology, yep. but they're sending those RNA in those tissues <coughs> off balance and you're picking that up. And so if it's an aberrant expression or it's aberrant proliferation of some microRNA, we don't, 
I, I'm assuming since this is yet three years or four years young field, if you don't have enough natural history characterization to say that in a variety of people, in a variety of ages, the same tissue will produce quantitatively and qualitatively the same, the yeah. same aberration signature. Yep. We do not have yeah. any papers. Yep. Thank you. Let's have one more question. Going once. Um, can you talk? Uh, can you talk about the price at all of the product, and uh, whether you're thinking about um, using some of the parts? Is it going to be reusable or disposable? Yep. Yeah. So um, I can tell you about my cost. I don't know the price. <laughs> uh, so uh, the, the reagents, it cost us around two cents per microRNA. Uh, so that's very, very cheap. Uh, the instrument, this version cost uh, around $80. This version, we don't know yet. Uh, the instrument cost around $1,000. Uh, this can be reusable if it's PCB. If it's paper, no. Uh, if it's plastic, no. So we still don't know. Uh, what we're thinking in terms of, of business model, but that's what we're thinking right now. It can be very different. It's uh, uh, the instrument free. It's so cheap that we can uh, subsidize it or, uh, or lease it. And uh, each test, it's a, it's a cost, uh, the reagents of each test. Okay, well, thank, thank you very much. And we'll thank you.